Good afternoon, good morning, wherever, I, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for joining us today and welcome to today's webinar, where Professor Victor Meyer Schoenberger, one of the co-authors, will be discussing their latest book titled Framers, Human Advantage in an Age of Technology and Turmoil. Our host for the session today will be Ivana Bartoletti, Global Chief Privacy Officer at Wipro, co-founder of the Women Leading in AI Network and OII Visiting Policy Fellow. A little housekeeping. We are fortunate to have a varied audience with a wide range of views, and we request that the opinions of others are respected in this space. For your awareness, this event is being recorded and will be posted on our website following the event. You can pose any question using the Q&A tab at any time, and these will be answered towards the end of the talk. Questions will be visible to all attendees and can be upvoted and commented upon, and we will endeavor to follow up any unanswered queries. Please allow me to introduce Ivana Bartoletti and Professor Victor Meyer Schoenberger. Great, thank you so much for this. And I'm absolutely delighted to be, to be hosting this. And this is not just because I moved to Frankfurt and I can show off my German in pronouncing Victor's last name, which is always very cool. Um, but um, no, but um, um, I'm absolutely delighted because, um, because um, um, in, uh, Victor is, uh, is uh, at the forefront of some of the topics that are so crucial in the age that we live in. Um, he was pioneering the field uh, when he wrote um, uh, Big Data, and, uh, um, but also in, uh, in, the, in this publication, um, which he co-authored, um, I think uh, the, his, um, his work is absolutely pioneering, um, and, um, and uh, not just because we're living with the artificial, we're living with artificial intelligence, and we have to um, discover, and we're discovering how humanity in the age of, of the artificial, um, but also because the delving into the issue of framing and uh, which is and the science behind it you know so the framing doesn't happen randomly but is is uh, the science behind it is absolutely important um, in the, in the times we live in uh, so really delighted to to welcome you all and uh, Victor I look forward to listening to your presentation and then I'm sure you've been updated with questions I already have a few ready um, and I've got a, one or two myself so um, without further ado over to you now. Thank you very much, uh, Ivana. This is uh, a wonderful and uh, tremendously uh, pleasurable, uh, a, a real honor uh, to be uh, talking about framers today. And thank you very much for your warm words as well. Well, framers, framers, our book is about a human superpower, about a human superpower that we are, many of us at least are, rarely aware of. So let me just set the stage uh, and try to also explain how I got involved in writing this book. It's co-authored uh, with Ken Couquier and Francis de Vericourt. Uh, Ken, of course, is a senior editor at The Economist and Francis de Vericourt uh, is, is a well-known decision scientist uh, currently at the ESMT. Um, so over the last 10 years or so, I have, been, I have been studying or looking at human decision-making, at our ability or inability to make good decisions like this bicyclist in the background who has to choose whether to go left or right. And if we look back over the last 40 or 50 years, what we realize is that uh, through a uh, path-breaking research done by psychologists like Kahneman and Tversky, and we have understood that human decision-making oftentimes is biased um, and that uh, our decisions are flawed. They're cognitively distorted. Uh, and um, a, a lot of times uh, when we read how badly our decisions are distorted, uh, we perhaps uh, want to give up. We are frustrated. But um, about 10 years ago, Ken and I said, maybe we can't do much about those biases, but we can at least try to help humans uh, try to base their decisions to the extent that they can and want to on facts rather than on fiction, on beliefs. And so we wrote big data and we uh, advocated uh, a, a data-driven uh, uh, society in which uh, our decision-making, 
our human decision-making is informed by the data that we have and the analysis of that data. And uh, this analysis of data, of course, has taken leaps and bounds, uh, particularly over the last half decade, uh, thanks to uh, various uh, approaches and tools of machine learning, uh, oftentimes referred to as artificial intelligence. Of course, uh, those in the field don't like that word particularly uh, much. But machine learning, that is the ability to train a system um, based on massive amounts of, of, of training data, has in fact uh, led to significant advances in a number of areas uh, and quite remarkable advances to boot. Uh, if we think of self-driving cars, then um, in 2015, when I first looked at the numbers, um, Google self-driving car was going about 2000 kilometers between human interventions on average. Now, um, 2020, last year, it was going almost 50,000 kilometers between um, human interventions. Uh, that's a dramatic 25-fold increase in about five years. Uh, very significant. And what is even more significant is that uh, the car manufacturers didn't increase that much. Uh, last year, the typical Daimler-Benz car uh, California was going on average about 60 kilometers before human intervention. Compare that to the almost 50,000 kilometers with Google. And you see uh, the, the, the power that massive amounts of training data and cutting edge machine learning can provide. But it's not just self-driving cars, it's things like playing poker, uh, where we see uh, surprising advantages of machine learning and massive data. Uh, or identification of cancerous moles, uh, or even uh, selecting pedagogical approaches uh, in education. All of these successes have prompted some, particularly in the Silicon Valley, to suggest that the future is actually to uh, amplify artificial intelligence, to amplify machine learning decision-making and to let the machines take over because human biases cannot be corrected easily. And so rather than being straight jacketed into human bias decision-making, we should actually switch to machines and machine decision-making. Uh, in the book, we call those the hyper-rationalists. They're one group of people. But there's also another group of people on the other end of the spectrum who argue that the problem isn't um, that there is too little rationality in human decision-making. Uh, their argument is that there is too much rationality in human decision-making. That We would be better off if we would rely on our gut, if we would shoot from the hip, if we would do what our, what our gut tells us. Uh, that emotions are the real drivers and we should give in to our emotions and base our decisions on emotions. And it seems that we are uh, in between a rock and a hard place as, as a society and perhaps even as a species having to decide between hyper-rationality on the one hand and uh, emotionalists on the, on the other. And our book is really about a totally different opportunity, uh, an opportunity to go back to us humans and to uh, uncover and then focus on a uh, cognitive uh, ability that we have. We call it a human superpower and it's the human superpower of framing. And so what is framing? Framing is a way by which we make sense of the world and then prepare ourselves for decisions. Frames are mental representations of reality. Uh, they're not covering all of reality, just a, a particular aspect of it. And we see reality, we see the world through these frames. Now, let me give you an example and, and ask you for your participation. 
here you see a, um, a graphic. Now, tell me how many rectangles you see on this picture. And if, if, if you want, please share your answer uh, in the chat with me. I'll give you 30 seconds or so to make up your mind and do the counting. And then please do let me know, do let us know. So how many rectangles do you say? Don't be shy, just share your, um, your answers with us. There is no right answer, I should hasten to add. Uh, this is about perception. This is about how we frame the world. I see that uh, Chico is suggesting five and uh, that's a great start. Uh, Johan is 11, I see 11, one, seven. That's fantastic. Now. We ask the same question to executives. And here is what they responded to. 14% uh, said zero, 28% said two, 33% said five. So Chico, you are in the majority here. And they were going up to 11. So Jennifer, if you are uh, represented there as well. What is interesting is that what we see depends on what we understand a triangle is. For those of you who think that a triangle is th three um, lines connected uh, uh, together, then there is no triangle here because there, are, there is not a single triangle that has all the lines connected. For those of you, of course, who who imagine that a triangle is something that has uh, three corners and, and you can imagine the lines connecting them, you see at least one, maybe four or five of them. But for those of you who look at those circles and see that there is a portion cut out and that looks like a triangle too, that adds up the triangles. What, what frame we bring to see the world depends on what we see uh, and, and vice versa. What we see depends on what frame we bring. So framing is crucially important and it leads to very different decisions, not just perspectives on reality. Let me give you an example from a uh, epidemic uh, that happened a couple of years ago uh, well before COVID-19. Uh, it has to do with Ebola uh, and it happened uh, in Africa. Uh, there, uh, there was an Ebola outbreak and the WHO, an international organization, and the NGO Medicine Sans Frontières, MSF, uh, were present uh, they, uh, at the uh, place of the outbreak and were monitoring it. Now, both of those organizations had exactly the same data. But when they looked at the data, when they interpreted the data, they brought to that interpretation, that exercise of interpretation, a particular frame. WHO looked at it from a temporal viewpoint, um, comparing it to previous outbreaks and thinking that the outbreaks numbers were relatively small and so, it was very similar to a previous to previous outbreaks, and it would essentially die off after a couple of weeks. Médecins Sans Frontières um, brought a geographic frame to it and said um, the numbers may be small, but their the, the, the cases are uh, spread around, and so th this geographic distance suggests that the virus may have spread far further than we think. And so MSF was suggesting for a strict lockdown, uh, while N uh, WHO basically was suggesting that it would die out by itself. 
Now, eventually, Ebola did not die out uh, and uh, it became a full-blown epidemic requiring uh, a drastic lockdown. So MSF won in this particular case, but it's not about winning here. It's about understanding that a different frame, a different mental representation with the same facts will lead you to different decisions, will lead you to see different decision options. It's the same with um, COVID-19 in the first wave in March and April uh, of 2020. Consider the two islands, uh, the United Kingdom and New Zealand. Um, again, very different frame of mind. In New Zealand, uh, the government, uh, when they heard of COVID, uh, were reminded of SARS and remembered SARS quite well. And so what they wanted was to eliminate the virus. They went into a drastic lockdown, cut travel, and two months later declared that the virus had been eliminated from New Zealand. Compare that to the United Kingdom where the government looked at uh, COVID-19 and the virus uh, and said, this is more like other coronaviruses. Uh, we, we, we know them. Um, it'll be like the sniffles and we'll just have to live through it uh, and get it over with. And therefore they didn't do lockdowns, they didn't stop international travel and, until uh, the uh, NHS was on the brink of being overwhelmed. Uh, and, and then that required uh, severe um, measures. Two months after uh, New Zealand was COVID free and uh, the UK recorded one of its deadliest days in the pandemic. Two frames, same data, different decisions. Now, you're gonna look at this and say, okay, I get it. I get it. I understand what framing is now, but so what? And the answer is that for a very long period of time, we understood that we are thinking in frames, we can't escape it, but that this was a fact of life, not more than that. The interesting thing is that over the last couple of years, uh, more and more researchers have realized that this is actually a tool, a tool that can be harvested, that can be used, that can be harnessed to provide us with better decision options. The idea is to make better decisions, not by choosing what of two mediocre options is the better one. The idea is to use framing to produce better decision options, more varied decision options, so that we have more options to choose from rather than just the two or maybe three mediocre ones that are obvious. And when we see what is possible, when we understand that framing is a tool we can use, uh, sometimes it's a really emotional moment. Uh, consider uh, uh, Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier the two uh, amazing researchers who uh, uh, did uh, uh, discover or develop the CRISPR gene editing tool. The truth is that it was actually uh, a, a staffer in Doudna's lab that saw what was happening, that saw CRISPR at work. And when he told Doudna, and not understanding what this was other than the facts, Doudna looked at it and Doudna saw the capability. She saw this not as a fact, but as a tool. And she said her hair was standing up when she realized that this could be used to edit DNA, to edit more generally gene sequences. It's this kind of uh, moment, this kind of hair standing up moment that we have when we realize uh, that human framing is a power that we can utilize rather than just a fact of life. Now, what do we need to do in order to, to realize that power? First, of course, is that we need to choose a frame. Sometimes we implicitly choose a frame that's there already. Uh, sometimes we make a very deliberate choice in what kind of frame to use. And then we need to apply the frame. Now, uh, what's, what's interesting is that uh, we are 
very much an armored with the, the, the ability to choose the right frame because choosing the right frame is incredibly powerful. Um, but interestingly enough, those that are successful or have been successful in choosing a frame are not getting much better over time doing it again. And there isn't in general um, uh, much improvement through practice. What's interesting though, is that once we have a frame and we apply it to a particular situation to help us uh, elicit better decision options, uh, we can actually get better in applying a frame and uh, producing better decisional options doing that. And we are helped by what we call the three C's, uh, causality, counterfactuals, and constraints. First uh, and simple is this causality. That is that our frames are almost always causal. They connect cause and effect. They, they seem to suggest that there is causality deeply built into the world. Uh, that may or may not be true, but that's how we understand the world. Sometimes, of course, we are totally wrong. We are off the chart. Um, we, we, we think that there is causality when there is just correlation. But more often than not, every single day, we make predictions about the world based on causality, and it works. It works um, by as we get up out of bed and, and open the faucet and water comes out. Uh, it, it, it works as we go to the bathroom and, and flush the toilet. These are all causal um, moments that we are assume, that we predict and assume happen, and indeed they do happen, um, uh, all the way up to uh, much more complex causal predictions. Uh, causality makes us feel empowered. They give us agency and at the same time bestow upon us responsibility. So we have causal templates that, that are the elements, the key elements of our frames. These causal templates have huge advantages because they enable us to learn. If we have one template in one particular situation and we can abstract and generalize, we can apply it to a different situation, uh, a, a different frame, um, a, a, a different context uh, and use the same frame. That kind of speeds up learning. Um, it's what uh, uh, Steven Pinker calls uh, uh, a um, uh, metaphor niche or learning from metaphors. Uh, and uh, Michael Tomasello uh, is referring to in a way as a cultural uh, niche that we have uh, uh, obtained in, in, in this um, world that we are living. Now, causality is only one part uh, of the, the, the three Cs, one part of framing. The second part is counterfactuals. That is, we, when we think in these causal templates, we imagine, we imagine not the world that we're in, we are imagining a different world, a world that is slightly different from the world that we are in. Uh, it's a world of counter, full of counterfactuals. Now, uh, you may be puzzled by the word counterfactual, a rather technical world word. Um, are we really thinking in counterfactuals? Well, let me give you a puzzle again. Think about this. How about uh, you have two pitchers? One has a five liter mark and the other has a three liter mark and you have a faucet with uh, unlimited water supply. How can you get exactly four liters into one of those pictures. Think about it. I give you a few seconds to think about it. Now, as you're trying to come up with the solution, and we can talk about the solution later on, but as you come up uh, or try to come up with a solution, what you're doing in your mind is imagining a world in which you put that much water in one pitcher, then pour water from one pitcher to the other pitcher and so forth. You are asking yourself, what if questions? And so 
what this is suggesting is that we humans are uh, thinking about the options that we have, thinking about the decisions that we face, trying to understand the world through what if questions, through counterfactuals, through uh, a particular kind of dreaming or imagining that we are engaging. And we are doing it, interestingly enough, from the very early age. You know, um, toddlers, when they play shop or they play doctor, um, um, for years we thought that they were honing their social skills. But it turns out that recent research has shown they're actually honing their counterfactual thinking. They're asking what if questions. What if the world is slightly like this or, or like this? What if this is happening, but not that? And as we are playing through these slightly different uh, variations of reality, uh, we learn to think in counterfactuals and to play the game of life out a couple of moves ahead. That's counterfactual thinking. And we start when we're very young and we never give up. When we go to the movies, when we read a novel, when we play a video game, we're always thinking in counterfactual. But importantly, crucially importantly, these kind of factuals are not pie in the sky. They are not crazy freewheeling thinking. These kind of factuals are tightly constrained. They're constrained so that they're only just slightly different than the world that we are experiencing. And this slight difference makes those counterfactuals actionable. Um, constraining those counterfactuals, constraining our thoughts, much like we, we, we use a rubber band to constrain something, is the key to coming up with good counterfactuals, with counterfactuals that are actionable, that are effective. And so constraints um, are important. Um, we come up with the, uh, con with, with, with the right constraints by using heuristics, heuristics like um, minimal change principle, mutability principle, consistency principle. But essentially what we're doing is we're, we're playing with constraints. We're, we're looking at some constraints that are, that are loose or that are tight, that are hard or soft, and that generates counterfactuals. Let me give you one very simple example um, from, uh, from technical innovation. Think about SpaceX and the rocket that lands back upright and can be reused. Reusable rockets, as it turns out, isn't something that SpaceX came up with. In fact, NASA was investigating reusability in the 1960s. Um, but at that time, you know, they, 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 they thought that they could not reignite uh, a rocket engine and land it back because the sensors weren't there, the processing power wasn't there. It was just too hard to do. And so they said, we have to do something that's easier uh, and came up with aerodynamic updrift as the key principle to reusability. And that brought them to the space shuttle and the wings. Now, having wings on a rocket is a really, really bad idea. Uh, when you think about it. Because on the way up, the wing is just heavy and creates uh, aerodynamic resistance. And on the way down, the wing is, because it, for going up, it needs to be small, doesn't generate enough aerodynamic uplift. So it's really not a particularly good glider. And that's precisely what the space shuttle was. It was dangerous on the way up. Uh, and it was a particularly bad glider on the way down. Um, uh, but NASA couldn't come up with uh, a better um, reusable rocket system um, because of the constraints, the hard constraints it was facing. Fast forward 40 years later, uh, SpaceX was realizing uh, that uh, processing power and sensors uh, and the ability to relight uh, rocket engines had greatly improved. And so they revisited this constraint and said, that's not a hard constraint anymore. That's a soft constraint. That constraint had become mutable. And so based on that frame of rockets, um, they could create a new option 
And that option was the rocket that lands back on the landing strip upright. That's the beauty of counterfactuals. The beauty of counterfactuals sums up the three C's, constraints, counterfactuals, causality. Now, how do we get better at it? You may ask as I wrap this up. Well, I wanna share three ways, three simple ways to get better at framing, uh, at applying a frame and at choosing a frame, both individually and in organizations and societally. But uh, of course, in the book, we have dozens of different strategies uh, that we suggest and put forward. I can only, uh, because of time constraints, provide you with three. The first one, uh, the most obvious one, is to really harness the power of constraints, to dream with constraints, to think about the counterfactuals that you can generate but haven't generated yet. The conventional options are not the ones that you want to look at. You want to broaden the option space, but in a very methodical way, in, a, in an uh, effective uh, and efficient way. And that is where those constraints come in. Think about what constraints your frames, uh, what constraints your counterfactual uh, imagination, and whether these constraints are still hard, cannot be changed, or whether they're soft under some circumstances. And if so, you know, um, prioritize those that are mutable, that are um, actionable for you uh, or for um, individuals, for humans, uh, rather than those that, that require more divine intervention. Um, prioritize those that are small, that require minimal change and that provide consistency. The second uh, strategy is to not just build up um, a library of frames in your mind. By the way, students do that all the time, especially in professional schools. Um, the case method is just a way by which we uh, train students to um, have um, lots of frames uh, available in their mind. But eventually you will face a situation where you run out of frames to use, where there is no good frame in your own repertoire to use. And that is where cognitive foraging comes into play. Cognitive foraging is, is running around and um, informing yourself of interesting things that happen outside of your core areas of expertise, not because you have a direct way to apply them, not because you have an an immediate use for those new insights, those, those different perspectives that you're gaining, but because it keeps your mind curious. It keeps you um, agile enough in your mind uh, to forage around uh, and to learn new things so that in case you hit a situation where you need to find a new frame, but you don't have one, you can then go out and know basically the feeling, know the process, know the practice of cognitive foraging. You don't have to start from scratch and take the jump, the plunge into the void. <clears throat> it's kind of a, a path that we already have tried before, not exactly, but kind of tried before. We have prepared ourselves to take different paths in a way. The third uh, strategy, of course, is to embrace diversity. That is to embrace cognitive diversity, to have a diversity of frames in your mind, frames that may even be contradictory. Now, how can you create, how can you foster and maintain cognitive diversity? Mostly by real diversity, practical, factual, social diversity. The advantage that organizations that are diverse have is that they also oftentimes have cognitive diversity. And this cognitive diversity isn't just the good thing to do. Um, it leads, as we suggest in framers, to better decision options and therefore improves human decision making. It's eminently more efficient and effective to have cognitive diversity 
then to have uh, cognitive monotony. This uh, cognitive diversity and this diversity inside of organizations, of course, can translate into uh, a similar diversity inside a society. There, we need cognitive diversity even more, uh, and we need to embrace the uh, ability of society to have contradictory frames and to accept contradictory frames at the same time. It's what we call uh, uh, pluralism of frames that we need to accept. Because only in the juxtaposition of uh, sometimes quite contradictory frames can we see options and perspectives that otherwise we can't. So where does this leave us? This very quick overview of what uh, my co-authors and I hope is a, is a far richer and more comprehensive look at human framing. Where does this leave us? Well, some out there suggest that after the pandemic is over uh, we, and we look into the future, we see a, a pathway that leads to fertile, through fertile meadows, that the world is getting better and better and better. And in some way, that's right. We have improved over the last hundreds of years, over the last couple of thousands of years. We are living longer and often better lives, although it has come at a huge cost. But looking at the challenges that we face individually as a society, perhaps even as a species, not just from talking about pandemics, but environmental degradation and catastrophe, uh, social uh, injustice and imbalances, uh, uh, all the way to, to very existential issues uh, of um, uh, biology, the next pandemic perhaps. As we face these huge challenges, uh, we think that the hardest part for humanity lies ahead of us. It isn't going to be easy for us. And as we face those very challenging moments, these huge challenges, uh, what we need isn't um, to resort back to the conventional options, uh, the, the usual suspects. We need to broaden our option space to come up with better decision options than we have, with uh, real innovative new ways to think about problems. And framing is the superpower that we possess to do that. It's, it's crucial that we take the superpower and use it. If the freedom of information, the free flow of, of, of ideas and knowledge was the crucial value that brought us that far, that helped humanity coordinate. The next hundreds of years will be characterized by a focus on decision-making. And we improve human decisions, not just by better coordinating, we improve human decisions by better framing, by maintaining an agility of mind. It's crucial that we are utilizing the superpower we possess. It's not only crucial, it may be existential. Thanks very much. Thank you, Victor. That is really inspiring and, and excellent. Um, it made me think about um, the example that you give in the book um, about that young woman in Africa that you mentioned. Um, indeed, indeed. If I if I may share yes, that, yes, please. Uh, yeah, because I think it's really, really relevant to what you were saying at the end. Um, a, a, a fabulous success story uh, from West Africa. Uh, normally, not a place for many success stories, uh, unfortunately. Um, there, they uh, what they have done, uh, what she and uh, two of her uh, colleagues have done, is to um, think about electricity. The, the grid there is really not functioning very well. Lots of people don't have electricity uh, and no electricity means uh, limited education, limited learning, uh, limited access to uh, commerce, uh, not enough safety. 
So they developed a lamp that has solar panels on it. So the, over uh, the course of the day, the battery in the lamp is being charged and in the evening, the lamp lits, lights up and provides uh, electricity, provides light, but also provides power for, for mobile phones to be recharged and so forth. But that's not the real innovation. The innovation was really um, a, a business model innovation, if you want. They looked at it and they said, this lamp, even though it's only a hundred euros or so, people can't afford it. So what they did was to take um, a template, a frame, if you want, from telecom and said, in telecom, people pay as they go. They don't purchase the phone, they pay an, a, a monthly fee. And so what if we do the same for electricity, therefore, for this lamp? People pay as they go, and once they have paid up after 24 months or so for the lamp, then they own the lamp. But beforehand, they get the light and just give a down payment, give a, an installment uh, every month. And by doing that, they brought the electricity to literally hundreds of thousands of people in West Africa and made a huge difference uh, to society there. Yeah. And I think, um, so um, I'm waiting for questions to come and, and um, but I, I have one that I wanted to ask you, Victor, if you don't mind. So um, I think, um, I mean, it's really fascinating because there is no doubt that we do need uh, to new frames and new approaches to things. You know, we can't just, as you say, we can't resort to the things from the past. The world has changed too much. We are in, in, in totally different um, ways of, uh, and even from an economic standpoint, from a legal standpoint, we can't just resort to tools that we've, we've had in the past. Um, but I wanted to ask you a question. So the question is, I mean, our ability to see alternative frames, you know, to conceive them, to see, to play and to dream with constraints, as you were mentioning. Do you feel that a lot of what I, what's happening, for example, in our digital ecosystem, do you feel that is, is reducing our ability to do so? I mean, don't you think that, you know, that, um, that, that the same sort of the world of, of the, you know, we're driven into particular parts, you know, through sort of browsing or through activities, doesn't that reduce the possibility to see something else? Mm. In some way, yes. In other ways, maybe no. It, it, it depends yeah. as usual, I guess. Um, but um, uh, for example, uh, consider a good um, um, video game puzzle uh, 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 like Monument Valley, a famous game a couple of years ago uh, on, on tablets um, where you were uh, basically navigating an Escherin world and, and you would be able to do things that you would normally not be able to do. It, it was a, a counterfactual world in a way, but a counterfactual world that you could uh, operate in. Uh, and uh, it was marvelous. It, um, I loved it. But what is interesting, my uh, young son loved it as well, um, because it stimulates the mind in a very interesting way. Uh, it, it, it lets you think um, around corners. Uh, and, and, and so it stimulates your, your, your generating uh, new options. That's the kind of um, use of digital tools that I think we should amplify, we should cherish, um, you know, rather than uh, having Facebook amplify um, a radical posts or so. Um, so in that sense, uh, I think what we need to ensure is that the tools, particularly the digital tools that we have, help us become better framers. Um, AI, in itself cannot frame, and we make that argument uh, quite uh, uh, strongly in the book, but what AI can do is to help us facilitate the framing. Um, we give the example that, that, that uh, DeepMind's chess program That's played true. extremely well, and unlike all the other chess programs, by taking very aggressive stance and, 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 and by uh, valuing position more than, than pieces, um, but it didn't realize that. It took a human to look at it to say, oh gosh, I'm now abstracting from it. And this is the kind of creative synergy I think that we need uh, digital tools to help us uh, create. Yeah, and I mean, and I think this is, 
as you know, this is what you're introducing is a it's an important frame in in relation to, for example, how we can use these tools in the education systems. You know, for example, there is a debate at the moment that people are having in, in you know, can we use tech technology and how far can we go in using technology in, in schools and education? And then, as you, as you said, you know, there are the purists and the ones who are completely, you know. Uh, so it's ideology on both sides. You know, yes, we we uh, the education will be completely replaced by computers, be completely replaced by robots. And on the other side, there are the ones who are like, no, we only need the more traditional uh, way of uh, of teaching. And there is a you know there is, there are ways in in the, in the middle between all of this. I'm looking if there are questions. Can you see? Oh. Yes, I can see. And and there was one that was related right to this. Yes. Uh, it was uh, uh, how can how would you advise an OII student to harness the power of framing? Yeah, um, and and and, and uh, um, uh, very uh, very important. Um, uh, in a in a way, of course, uh, very tritely, but by by looking at problems from different perspectives, of course. Um, but uh, but there is more to it and more nuance to it than this trite cliche uh, might, uh, might provide. Uh, and, and let me give you a real world example. My son um, is uh, 11 and he is um, currently taking part in an online school once a week called the Synthesis School. The Synthesis School um, uh, is done by people who did the Ad Astra School for SpaceX. And when they, this, when they did this uh, at Astra School for SpaceX folks, uh, the, the, the fundamental idea was we don't want people, we don't want students to learn uh, stuff, content. We want them to acquire frames so that they build up a repertoire of frames very early on. And, and whether it's a um, uh, uh, evolutionary frame or um, uh, the, the, the frame of game theory, uh, or whether it's a homeostasis as a frame, uh, various different frames. And they came up with a couple of dozen of them. And they're, they're teaching them through games that the students play. And it's amazing. I can have a conversation with my 11-year-old about a game of chicken and, and game theory and so forth. He doesn't call it a game of chicken or prisoner's dilemma or so forth. He has different words for it but he's thinking in these frames and he's then taking this template and applying it to, to, to other situations. And it's this kind of um, cognitively understanding that what we are good at is creating these templates and then playing with these templates and, and loosening and, and tightening constraints and creating options that, uh, that, that, that I would highlight. Um, and when I teach my classes, uh, at the OII, uh, that's what I tried to do. I, I, I taught a class once called uh, um, uh, Law and the Internet. And at the end of the class, um, I got a, uh, a little note from my students and they said, this was great because it was neither about the law nor about the internet. <laughs> um, and this is, it was a phenomenal compliment for me because that's exactly what I wanted. I wanted to convey, I wanted to communicate that this is about how we look at the world. And as we play with how we look at the world, we play with these frames. Uh, as we frame things differently, uh, we open up option spaces and we see opportunities that otherwise we don't see. Um, and so, um, so, so that's, I, I think, an, a huge opportunity for education. And unfortunately, um, uh, a big wastage currently in education because it's not done there enough. Yeah. Victor, there's another question here, which is really interesting because it's uh, how are decision makers received your book? And it's fascinating idea so far. So um, when we, when we uh, go and talk to <coughs> policy makers or decision makers and companies, um, managers and so forth, they're kind of like, some of them maybe don't get it, but many of them look at it and say, oh, no shit, pardon my French. And it, it's kind of putting words to what some of them have been doing. And it creates kind of a, 
an operationalizable and implementable kind of toolbox for them almost. And I say, oh, now I can do with uh, and deal with this. And I can also make sense of what I'm experiencing, uh, what kind of problems experience, what kind of life decisions I'm experiencing. Um, so uh, the um, very, very interestingly, the, the reception has been extremely positive. Great. Um, there's a question about diversity. Um, diversity is so important within an individual and across individuals, yet we face many barriers to putting together really diverse teams. How can we start to overcome such barriers? So um, what, what is interesting here is, uh, of course, uh, we, um, we need to um, be uh, far more embracing of um, social diversity inside the organizations we need to go sometimes even outside the organizations, bring people in uh, and, and all the like. But it's, it's really important to also understand how hard it is to do diversity well. Um, because sometimes you may think you have diversity, but you don't. There is this somewhat controversial example of, of a study done in Norway uh, where um, uh, uh, companies in Norway that didn't have diversity on their boards, particular gender diversity, were forced to bring, bring about gender diversity. And then a couple of years later, after they had brought in more women on their boards, uh, their, their performance was compared. And it, 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 it turned out that, the diverse, that there was no diversity bonus. But what is really interesting about this is that um, A, uh, uh, these companies that were already the laggards uh, in diversity in the first place may have been very um, hostile places for diversity. So just having uh, a little bit more gender parity in their boards may not have done much uh, uh, in terms of decision-making as Scott, I think uh, rightly points out. The other thing of course is um, that um, many women that they brought along turned out to be family members of existing board members uh, and having been socialized uh, in the same um, social stratum um, as the other male board members. That's not real diversity there. That doesn't bring the diversity bonus. Real diversity bonus we get from people who think very different than we do. Um, and of course, getting them in or into organizations and keeping them in organizations is incredibly hard. In the book, we described that the New York Times brought along, brought on board Barry Weiss, uh, um, a quite outspoken conservative Jewish commentator. Um, uh, and uh, she was on board the New York Times and did uh, uh, op-eds for uh, the gray lady uh, uh, and, until she felt she couldn't any longer because uh, People from the um, from the journalistic side uh, were, um, were 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 pushing her out. Um, were insinuating that there was no place for her at the Gray Lady, um, and 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 so there is tremendous cost uh, involved. Uh, diversity is not cost free; it's costly. But we strongly feel and argue and provide evidence that at the end of the day, the diversity bonus is much larger uh, than, the, than the initial investment that you need to make. One interesting element in organizations though that we came across or in teams is in particular is um, that it is better for team members to first think about the problem alone for an hour or for two and to come to the team meeting with strong views, because otherwise in teams, you may have the alpha animal in the team and everybody is converging around the alpha animal's view very quickly. If you have team members think about it individually beforehand for a significant amount of time, their views have hardened a bit. And so consensus cannot be achieved that quickly. And that means we have more discussion. And that means we have more options on the table rather than just the one or two that the, um, that, that the alpha animal uh, uh, puts forward or, or is associated with. 
There are two questions that are very related in here. Um, we've got a few minutes left. And it's about um, sort of polar polarized political frames and 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 also the sort of the role in the, of the media within this, you know, because yes. um, filter bubbles and diverse yes. information, but less share understanding. So if you could address that. Yes, and and the the the, the answer is unfortunately straightforward but incredibly hard. And that is um, it is utterly wrong from a framing viewpoint to try to reduce the spectrum of viewpoints present in society. Sure. Um, now, it may be efficient to do that, um, but it is, but in the long run, uh, it is uh, in, in, um, incredibly uh, dangerous, particularly when we face new challenges, novel challenges, where we need to come up with novel solutions, where, where um, it's, it's, it, it's not as, um, easy as in the past. Moreover, um, it, it may be the ethically and morally right thing to suppress some viewpoints that we violently disagree with, but it comes at a cost. And that cost is that we, we, we are reducing the option space. Now, we, there may be good reason to do that in, in, in certain instances, to, um, to, to reduce uh, the, the spectrum of voices. But we must realize uh, that uh, this impoverishes the option space that we have available. And the, 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 the biggest challenge, of course, for us uh, as democracy is that um, after a supposed triumph of the 1990s of the democratic model, we now realize that uh, pluralism uh, is much more uh, than having elections. Absolutely. Um, and last question, and then, um, and this, um, do you think that we can make greater impact by changing our individual everyday framing or focusing on larger collective group framing? We have the biggest impact, we have the biggest impact not by, um, by, by, by shifting frames, by switching frames, but by working within the frame that we are. The frames, the frames that we have, the frames that we are, are far more flexible and elastic as we may think. Uh, but the problem for a lot of people, including um, extremists, is that they're in a frame and they don't understand that their frame is far more elastic than they want it to be. So they generate far less options um, than, than, than their frame would permit. Um, switching a frame is something, a bit of an art rather than a practice. Working in a frame with practice, we get better. That's the, 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 the easiest, lowest hanging fruit that we have. Uh, and we need to do that individually and we need to do it organizationally. There is no either or. Fabulous. Uh, thank you so much. It's, um, as uh, in a comment, very interesting and uh, um, uh, very, very, very good. And there is also, I think, as the, the link to where to purchase the book is, always, is, is also being published. Um, can I hand, yes, you go there. <laughs> um, can I hand over to um, the host now? But uh, thank you so much. It's been absolutely fabulous to, to host this. Thank you very much, Ivana. Thank you so much. Thank you both to our speakers for giving us their time and expertise today and for providing us with an education on our own framing techniques and potential for reframing. And thank you to the audience for joining us. You'll receive a follow up email in due course and a link to the recording. Be sure to check out our website for our full webinar schedule for this term. Thank you again and have a wonderful day.